Hello students, this is Mr. Courtney here. And in this video, we're going to be talking about the periodic table. And we're just going to be looking at an introduction to the periodic table. So we'll look at the contribution of Newlands, Mendeleev, and Mosley to the modern periodic table. Discuss the arrangement of the periodic table. Classify elements as metals, non-metals, metalloids. Discuss properties of metals and non-metals and the natural states of elements. Since scientists have been able to isolate and study single elements, they have known that some elements have very similar physical and chemical properties. So if you look at lithium, sodium, and potassium, they're all soft silvery gray metals that can be cut with a knife and they all react violently with water. Early chemists realized that for the known elements, the similarities between elements seem to come in sets of threes, which they called triads. They also realized that the average mass of the elements were close to that of the middle element, which, be the, which became known as the law of triads. So for example, lithium has a mass of 6.9 grams, sodium 23.0 grams, and potassium 39.1 grams. If we were to find the arithmetic mean or the average of these three masses, we will find that it lies very close to the middle one, which is sodium of 23.0. Based on this, scientists concluded that these elements were related on the atomic level. Many other triads were discovered. While a list of, while a list of elements existed, they were not organized in any particular order. And the idea that there might be a natural order to the elements resulted in the quest to find pattern to this order to find this order. John Newlands was one of the first to present an idea about how the elements were related. He placed the known elements in order of increasing atomic mass and noticed that the similarities repeated every eight element. He called this the law of octaves because it reminded him of the musical scale, the law of octaves. Newlands idea worked perfectly for some elements, for elements 3 to 18. There were issues with this because he used only the known elements at the time. And because many elements were not discovered, there were some issues with his period, with his table. His idea was not taken seriously because of the placement of several elements. For example, cobalt and nickel appear in the same column as chlorine. Iron and, ox iron, oxygen, and sulfur appear in the same column. Copper was found in the same column as lithium, sodium, and potassium. So those were the issues with his periodic table. Dmitry Mendeleev cre created the first widely accepted periodic table. He still relied on the groups of eight but he realized that many elements were not yet discovered or they were missing and left gaps where he thought these elements belonged. This helped with the proper alignment of the groups or the proper orientation of the groups. He predicted, he also predicted the properties of these undiscovered elements. And when these elements were later discovered, like germanium was discovered, it, its properties were almost identical to what Mendeleev had predicted predicted. So here we have our blank spaces that he left for the unknown element. Based on the work done by Rutherford and Niels Bohr, Henry Mosley used X-ray diffraction to determine the number of protons in an atom. And by determining the number of protons, he also determined the atomic number. So he arranged the elements in order of increasing atomic number instead of increasing atomic mass. And the uh, groups seem to fall into the expected order or the elements seem to fall into the expected groups now if we look at compare his arrangement to that of Mendeleev's arrangement take for example cobalt which has a higher atomic mass than nickel so cobalt has a atomic mass than nickel but has a smaller atomic number 27 compared to 28 in Mendeleev's table, nickel would be placed before cobalt. And that time didn't seem to fall into the right places. So now we have a rearrangement of some of the elements on the periodic table based on Henry Mosley's new arrangement 
of putting the elements in order of increasing atomic number. The modern periodic table is based on Moseley's arrangement. The elements are arranged in increasing atomic number. As we can see here, we go from 3 to 4, and we continue 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 as we go along. And elements with similar properties are can be found in columns and rows. Now the periodic law states that there's a repetition of physical and chemical properties of these elements when they are arranged in order of increasing atomic number. So the term periodic means repeated regular intervals or patterns. Kind of like what we go back to what John Newlands were saying that there were patterns that repeated every eight element. Remember he called that the law of octaves. A period is a row on the periodic table and the rows or a period go from the left to right. So they are the horizontal they're horizontal. They go from left to right. Elements in the same period have the same number of energy levels. You may hear shells, and we'll talk about all that later on. A group is a column on the periodic table, and a group is also known as a family. So this would be one family, it's another family. So all these columns on the periodic tables are called groups or families. Elements in the same group have similar chemical properties because they have the same number of valence electrons. And we'll talk about valence electrons later on also. The elements in group 1A, excluding hydrogen. So these elements here, excluding hydrogen, are called alkali metals and have one valence electrons. Elements in group 2A, they're going to have two valence electrons and they're called alkaline earth metals. The elements in group 7A or group 17, they're going to have seven valence electrons and they are called the halogens. Elements in group 18 or group 8A, they're called the noble gases. They all have eight valence electrons. All these here will have eight valence electrons except helium which has two. When we look at the arrangement of electrons in the atom we'll see why it's placed in that group even though it only has two valence electrons. The group numbers followed by the letter A are called the main group elements or the representative elements so that means that we have group 1A, group 2A, group 3a, 4a, and these here are called the main group elements. The elements between group 2a and 3a. So these elements here are called the transition metals. And these elements at the bottom here, they fit in right here on your periodic table. And they're called the inner transition metals. The dark jagged line on the periodic table separates the periodic table into two sections. This is our dark jagged line here. So it separates it into two sections, or we say two types of elements. We have metals and non-metals. Elements to the left of the jagged line are metals. And the non-metals are found on the right side of the jagged line. So again, all the elements to the left of the jagged line will be metals and all the elements to the right will be non-metals. So if you look at the physical properties of metals, metals are able to conduct heat and electricity. We use metals in these wires that we use to conduct electricity. If you've ever left a hot spoon, sorry, a metal spoon in the pot while you're cooking and you go back to touch it five or so minutes later it feels hot because it's a good conductor of heat and electricity they have high luster that means they have a shiny appearance so think some jewelries think about rims on cars and those kind of things they're malleable they can be hammered into thin sheets so think of aluminum foil they're ductile that means they can be pulled into wires think of your metal wires now all your metals will be solids at room temperature except mercury, which is going to be a liquid at room temperature. 
Your non-metals exhibit basically the opposite physical properties of metals. They're poor conductors of electricity. They're non-lustrous. Lustrous, sorry, so that means they don't have a shine. And they can either be solids or gases. So they can exist as solids as gases. And we talked about noble gases before. And these are the elements in group 8A or 18, and they do not readily react with other elements. All your non-metals will either be solids or gases at room temperature, except bromine, which is a liquid at room temperature. The elements that, are, that lay along that jagged line, except aluminum, they're called metalloids or semi-metals. And think of the word semi meaning half or part in some cases. They're called metalloids or semi-metals because they exhibit both properties of metals and non-metals. So if it's a non-metal, it will show properties of metals and non-metals. If it's a metal, it will show properties of both metal and non-metals. The natural states of elements refers to the state of matter in which the elements can occur in nature or the state in which they occur in nature and there are seven elements that exist as diatomic molecules that means that they are made up of two atoms of the same element and they are elements because they are made up of the same type of atoms so we have iodine bromine chlorine fluorine oxygen nitrogen and hydrogen and you see the h with a subscript of two or they all have a subscript of two indicating that there are two atoms of that element present. And that's why they're called diatomic molecules. Now we can also use a mnemonic device to help you remember these diatomic molecules. So if we say, I brought clay for our new house, that helps us to remember iodine, bromine, chlorine, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. If we look at the periodic table itself, the elements are arranged in what seems to be like the shape of a seven. We start with nitrogen, go to fluorine, and then on to iodine, and then hydrogen over here. So these are our seven diatomic molecules. Elemental solids are solids in the natural form, and the atoms are packed in a regular or repeating pattern. Now, the arrangement of the atoms can affect the properties of a solid. If you look at graphite and diamond, for example, they are both composed of carbon atoms, but they have different physical properties. You can write with graphite, which is found in your pencil, not lead, but you cannot write with diamond. Diamond is very hard and can be used to cut other substances, while graphite is relatively soft. The carbon atoms in graphite are layered and arranged in an infinite array. And these layers are able to slide past each other because they're relatively weak forces of attraction between them, as we see here. However, in diamond, each atom or each carbon atom is attached to four others forming a tetrahedron or a tetrahedral shape, which makes diamond very, very hard. So if you look in diamond, if we look at our individual carbon atoms, let's use this one here. We have it connected to one, two, three four different carbon atoms which forms a tetrahedron so here we have different forms of the same element and they're different forms because they have different arrangement of atoms and these substances are called allotropes all right so this takes us to the end of this lesson for today until the next time i'm out blessings